so we were working through Mendel's experiments, and we were discussing the two hypotheses, hypotheses that he generated. And one of them was this idea of allelic segregation. And you'll remember that the allele is an alternative version of the gene. He called the gene the heritability factor or a heritable factor. So you have one gene or heritable factor, two alternatives that we call alleles. In those alleles, this is where we ended. One was going to be dominant and one was going to be recessive. So if you sort of consider the data that you have in the F1 generation, what you saw was there was no white flowers. So in other words, the trait of one of the parents seemed to just basically disappear. Based off of that F1 data, he proposed three possible explanations. So those three possible explanations is that the white flower heritable factor, so you could consider white to be a separate gene and purple to be a separate gene or heritable factor. He said that heritable factor for the white flowers might have just disappeared. So it just disappeared altogether. A second option is that the heritable factors from both the white plants and the purple flower plants just simply mixed together. And then the third option is that the heritable factors exhibit that dominance recessive relationship. So that dominance and recessive relationship, which you are all familiar that this is already going to be the correct explanation. But we need some data to refute the other two. And that data comes from the F2 generation as well. So based off of the F2 data, we can generate some conclusions. First, in the F2, you'll remember that we had one white flowered plant for every three purple flowered plants. So in that F2, the white returns. That symbol right there, the three dots, that's therefore. So the F2, the white returns, therefore, it did not just simply disappear. So we can eliminate explanation one from above that the heritability factor for the white simply disappeared. So we have two more options, one that they mix, the other that there's a dominance and recessive relationship. We can return back to the one F1 generation. And we can take a look at the purple plants that were produced and compare the hue or the coloration of the F1 compared back to the parent. And what we see is that these colors are identical. And since they're the same color as the parent generation, that would indicate most likely that there's no mixing that occurred. You would expect that purple and white would produce probably a much lighter purple color. Something more like a lilac or something like that, which is with additional characteristics. So we have good evidence and good reason to eliminate the first two possible explanations. So that third explanation of dominance and uh, recessiveness is probably going to be the most correct interpretation. So chasing after that third explanation, there are some additional explanation or uh, implications rather that we should probably begin to consider.
So a third explanation says that the heritability factors exhibit dominance and recessive relationships. So some of the implications of this third interpretation are going to be that organisms require two alleles. So two versions of the heritability factor. And it makes sense that they would receive one per parent. So organisms acquire two alleles, and it's one allele per parent. And it is going to be these alleles, or these alternative versions of the heritability factor that actually exhibit the dominance and the recessive qualities. In other words, we're not receiving two separate heritability factors. We're receiving one heritability factor, and two versions of that heritability factor. One that will define white, and one that will define purple. And the idea of dominance and recessiveness indicates that one of those alleles is expressed over the other. So if one expresses over the other, the dominant expresses over the recessive. In order to see the recessive, so recessive expression, that means that you cannot have the overarching dominance present. So no dominant allele can be present. So the implications of uh, explanation three, that the heritability factors exhibit dominance and recessiveness, or the dominant recessive relationship, is that the organism is going to get two alleles, one from each parent. The Alleles are going to exhibit that dominant relationship quality, which means that the dominant is present, it's always going to be expressed. So in order to achieve recessive expression, we have to eliminate the dominant. The easiest way to explain all of this is that the alleles split to two different gametes. They're in the process that produces those gametes, what we now know today as meiosis. So the confirmation of all of this, we basically should expect to see, and that's what you see here with the law of uh, segregation, is in the F2 generation, if we have Dominant, dominant, and recessive, recessive, true breeding individuals, we should get a known ratio. And we should be able to define the ratio based off of what types of individuals we should have predicted power influence. So if we know the genotype of one organism, we know that it's true breeding, or we know that it was created as an F1, we should be able to determine what outcome is going to be of the F2 generation. So this predicted power comes out in ratios, and because of the mathematical makeup and consequence of a dominant recessive relationship, it should be predicted that a 3 to 1 ratio is going to be present in the F2 generation. Which is really what we have discovered. And so he's going to go through and do, Mendel goes through and does additional experiments on a variety of different characteristics, setting those experiments up in a variety of ways. And his, uh, his method that he uses is going to be 
to denote the crosses. And he was meticulous in his note taking and his ability to denote crosses. Now, the way that we organize it today, a little bit different than the way that Mendel did, but we use these things called the Punnett square. And you've all used Punnett squares before, but I want to make sure that we basically have a good idea of what the Punnett square actually is going to actually going to mean. So we're going to go through and denote some crosses here. And we're going to define some terminology. For organisms that are considered to have two equal alleles. So the two alleles that are present are the same version of that gene. Those individuals are called homozygous. So our example here of pea plants. If the organism has alleles that both code for purple, 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 purple we would denote these individuals capital W, capital W. I'm going to tell you why that is here in just a second. Maybe you've already sort of figured it out. But homozygous dominant, purple, purple, capital W, capital W. The homozygous recessive, which would be the white allele and the white allele, or little w, little w. So when we denote the cross, when we denote the organism, we always use the recessive trait. Now a lot of people have kind of forgotten this convention and you'll have, okay, I have long and short, and so or tall and short, and so it's going to be big T, big T, little T, little T. But that's wrong. It actually should be not short but dwarf, and so it should be big D, big D, little T, little T. Because it should always be based off of the recessive. And that's good convention because a purple plant could be big W, little w, and still be purple. Whereas the white plant only can be little w, little w. And so we have just one option for denoting the cross. Because this individual, why would why couldn't we call it, uh, you know, a, a big P and a W or you know whatever. Here, it's just one single option, little w, little w. So that's the convention that they just stick. The homozygous individuals in Mendel's parent generations were all true breeding. So they were homozygous going to in the F1 generation, they generated all purple plants for this first cross. And these individuals would have one dominant and one recessive. And we're going to call those heterozygous or heterozygous individuals. In the heterozygous individual, it's two alleles that are not equal or are different. So the heterozygous individual would be purple and white, or it could also be white and purple. And the way that we would denote these, typically what we denote them as is a capital W, little w, but it is actually just as correct to say little w, big w. find these in the F1 generation a mono hybrid cross. And these organisms are not true green. Okay, a couple more terms that we need to be familiar with. The color of these plants, the purple and the white, I'm going to call that 
and an outward expression. The term that we use for outward expression is the phenotype. So in this first monohybrid cross, my phenotypes are purple. So that's the outward expression. What does it actually look like? Some of you have brown hair, black hair, blonde hair. Those are all phenotypes, the outward expression. We can also determine the genetic makeup. In other words, what are the alleles that are present, what genes are present, and what version of those genes are present. And we call that the genotype. So you have the phenotype, which is the outward expression, and the genotype, which is the genetic expression. And in the case of our purple and white plants, we have four possible genotypes. And what we're going to find out is one of those genotypes will be equivalent. We have the dominant homozygote. Then we have two different versions of the heterozygote. And then lastly, we have the recessive homozygote. So these two things are equivalent. We typically denote them just simply as the dominant recessive instead of recessive dominant. However, when you start to look at a Punnett square, it's very valuable as you do that Punnett square for, like, let's say the F2 generation, to remember that you have two different versions of the heterozygote from a genotypic standpoint, even though they are identical. So if I draw out the Punnett square, a monohybrid cross, and we take our purple plant, true breeding, and then our white plant, true breeding, and I do my cross, really I'm going to end up with dropping down my big W, and then my little W in both of these, because you usually go from the top first, and then you go from the side as you begin to put in. So the F1, you end up with your big W, little W, and then if I take these two individuals and breed them together to draw a fun square here for this breeding. Now I have my big W and my little W, my big W and my little W. And what's the convention? Always drop in first from the top. So big W, big W here is going to be little W, little W. And then as we go in across here, you can see. that these two individuals actually have a different genotype directionality, even though it's really the same genotype of the same people. Okay. So these would be considered to be identical from a phenotypic standpoint. They're all purple, same as this purple here. And these are white, so there's my three to one ratio. But in the genotype from just convention, we would mark those as being different genotypes but are equivalent. Okay, so that's allylic segregation. That was one of the uh, one of the outcomes to these crosses, one of the observations. I'm gonna go ahead and literally have everything I need. The second outcome is called independent assortment. Independent assortment. Now, independent assortment, you cannot determine from a single monohydrate cross. By the way, what's a monohydrate cross doing in the definition? Um, okay. Okay. Not one generation, but it is one something. What were the characteristics of the parent generation? And it's specifically for the cross that we just talked about. 
purple? Yeah, only one trip. Only one trip. Good. Mendel is going to go from here after doing a bunch of monohybrid crosses, and he extends his crosses, and he begins to look at what are called dihybrid crosses. So he begins to perform these things called dihybrid cross. What do you think of dihybrid cross? So now we're looking at two different traits. So we're still using two different plants, but those two plants are going to be true breeding on those two different traits. So we might do purple flowers and inflated pods, and then white flowers and deflated pods in the second year. So we're trying to get towards this idea of independent assortment. So what if it was not independent assortment? What if it was dependent assortment? What would our offspring in the F2, what would they look like? If it was dependent assortment, that means that these two traits, purple flowers and plated pods, are somehow linked together. And if they're linked together, then they end up the same in the F2 as they were in the F1. So the only type of plants I could produce would be purple flowers with inflated pods and white flowers with deflated pods. But when you start to do those dihybrid crosses, those weren't the results that we got, right? We began to see purple flowers with deflated pods and white flowers with inflated pods. And so we began to see a much larger number of possibilities. So in other words, what I'm saying is the purple plants didn't always have to go with inflated pods. We could have inflated pods that showed up with white plants. So they assorted independently. They distributed independently into the auction. Is everybody following me? So let's lay out a cross here. Let me sh first show you what it would look like if we had dependent assortment. Because I think it's important to understand this. Dependent assortment would mean that whatever the characteristics in that dihybrid cross, whatever they were, they'd always have to go together. So let's say I have a purple plant with inflated pods. And I have a white plant with deflated pods. Okay, so purple inflated, white deflated, and for simplicity's sake, we're going to stick with these being the recessive. So what are my genotypes going to be? Well, here on the top, I'm going to have big W, big W, big D, big D. Down here on the bottom, I'm going to have little W, little W, little D, little D. Okay? So now these parents, as they begin to generate their gametes, each of these pairs is going to split, but the W, one of the W's and one of the D's is going to go together. So for producing the gametes in this first parent generation, I'm going to have only big W, big D. Those are the only types of gametes I can produce. For the second parent, the white deflated, it would be little d, or little w, little d. And so the cross here would be big D, big w, big d, big w, big d, big w, big d, little and little. And so when I did the cross and distributed things through, That's what we should expect. And what you can see, that would be the F1. And then what you can see from the F2, the gametes of the F2. So this is the parent generation 
I'm sorry, the gametes of the F1 gametes that can be produced. If it's going to be independent assortment or not independent assortment, I could only generate big WD, little WD, big WD, little WD for both of those. Put those into the cross, and it's going to be a three order ratio. So that's if it's dependent assortment. Basically, I'm still only going to have really just the, the three different genotypes and two different phenotypes. Okay? But what we find when we actually do an experiment, and in this case, we're using pea plants that are yellow and smooth, and pea plants that produce green peas that are wrinkled. So there's my two traits. My genes are going to be for the P morphology, either smooth or wrinkled, and then the P color, the alleles are going to be yellow and the other allele is going to be green. Independent assortment, I'm sorry, dependent assortment would tell me that basically I have a three to one ratio where I have three yellow smooth peas for every one wrinkled green pea. That would be dependent assortment. This is the results that he got from the dihybrid cross. And you can see that I have four different versions of peas. And they're not in a 3 to 1 ratio, they're actually in a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. So the, the result here is that the color yellow does not always have to be associated or dependent upon the smooth morphology of the pea. That yellow pea can also be a wrinkle. So let me kind of spell this out here. So we'll do, I think you already have this. Just to kind of get you back into your notes. The cross experiment example that he does the dye hybrid the characteristics are going to be P or C color. And we'll have yellow and we'll have green. This is for independent sorting. We're going to have yellow and we're going to have green. And for seed shape, we are going to have smooth or wrinkled. And Mendel is really asking the question. His, his, his question for the dihybrid cross. This curious question is summarized as, do alleles always go together? Do alleles always go together in a plant? Dominant with the dominant, recessive with the recessive. So if I breed the yellow and the and the, the yellow 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 smooth and green smooth as parents, I should always expect to get yellow yellow um, peas that are smooth and green peas that are green. So the F1, if yellow and smooth are dominant, I should expect to see all yellow and smooth, and then in the F2, three yellow and smooth for every one green and wrinkle. That would mean that they are sorting dependent of each other. Okay. We'll pick up with the question, do alleles always go together in a plant? We always have dominant, dominant, recessive, recessive. Or it could be you have a dominant that always goes recessive. But the point is that you can't mix and match to create new alternative colors and shapes. 